Um, no, it's interesting. I saw on the, the news last night that they're expecting this huge storm in the Midwest, dropping, dropping another like, feet of snow in some of the, 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 you know, the Midwest and central states. And when the time it gets here, it's like, eh, it drizzles. So, <coughs> it's fine with me. They can have it out there. A lot of people interested in the in our presidents. I don't know why. I said there's a lot of people interested in our presidents. A bunch of strange guys. I will tell you. No, I will. I will. Sh I will tell you who the who these guys are. Okay. Yes. Oh, is that right? Where down there were now in Berkshire Dome during the World War II, that was SKF, they manufactured Paul Berry's for mm -hmm. And uh, my sister worked in there, and she told my mother every once in a while to find out what the weather was like. Yeah. And they built those without windows. Yeah, it's amazing. But it was just a, a funny anecdote that she, she had no idea it was a it was blizzard out there. Okay, I guess I might as well begin. Um, thank all of you for coming down. This is so great to see all you people, real people. Wow. It really is. It's so nice. So I'm so glad that you took the opportunity. And um, my name is Herb Kaufman. I think most of you I've met before, and in case not, you know, my name is Herb. And I teach different aspects of history. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today, we're going to talk about, actually, the way this started. Somebody came up to me um, a couple months ago and said, could you do a program on some of our presidents? And I thought, oh, that's boring. So I figured maybe there's something like more interesting about the presidents. And you'll see I came up with quite a number of really interesting, I think you'll find them uh, quite fascinating presidential facts. And as a matter of fact, we're going to start off with who was really our first president. Now we're all taught, of course, that the first president is... George Washington. And there's a lot of people in history and people in this country who will argue that fact with you. Now, the way this all starts, um, going back a little bit into history, so you give you a sense of, of what's going on, um, there was something in the United States in the, 86, in the um, 1740s called the French and Indian War. And this was where the uh, English defeated the French and took, took control of most of the, uh, the colonies in the Western area. So what happened was the English parliament decided, I think we should tax the colonies. Now, of course, you remember the famous line, you know, taxation without representation, because the colonies were not represented in the English parliament. So they started imposing all these taxes, and there was an uprising and a rebellion and all kinds of things going on. And then finally, the English Parliament came out with a set of five laws they called the Coercive Acts. And in America, we call them the Intolerable Acts. And that led to one of the things that led to is the famous Boston Tea Party where the Sons of Liberty, you know, dressed as Indians, when everybody knew they weren't Indians, I mean, come on. But they threw 10,000 pounds, that's dollar pounds, not, not, you know, in, of the tea. Can you imagine today that's, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of tea into Boston Harbor? Well, here again, this is a, a cartoon by Paul Revere. Many of you know the story of Paul Revere. Remember, listen, my children, you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. The only problem with that poem is he never rode. 
But uh, he only wrote for about an hour, you know, but that was Henry Lawsworth Longfellow's poem written many, many years later. But Paul Revere was an artist. He was a uh, silversmith. Uh, he was actually a dental, a forensic dentist. He did lots of things. And this is a picture of the symbol of America, which is Columbia. That's the woman. She is also on top of the United States Capitol. There's a statue of Columbia representing America and the British holding her down and pouring tea down her throat. Well, in response to this, these coercive acts, Members of the representatives of the colony said, we're going to get together. We have to meet for the first time. We have to all get together and form a united front. So they came to Philadelphia, and they met in Carpenter's Hall. Now, in Carpenter's Hall, the representatives of the colonies decided what we need to do is elect a president. And there he is. That is Peyton Randolph. And he was called the first president where someone represented all of the colonies together in a legislative process. So there are many people in the state of Virginia who will tell you that Peyton Randolph is indeed our first president. Now, after that, we declared our declaration of independence from England. Now, when we declared the Declaration of Independence, there was a gentleman named John Hancock, who was president of the colonies. And when the broadside came out, I know it's hard to see at the bottom, but I put it in the center, printed on the bottom, it says, John Hancock, president. So there are many people who will tell you that's the day we declared independence and that's the day we had our first president, which was John Hancock. Now, what they did in Congress, you'll love this one, they said presidents have to have term limits. So after one year, we'll switch to somebody else. So you could only be president for a year initially. So these are some of the other gentlemen who served as president of the United States. Well, then, of course, we get Lord Cornwallis. He loses the big battle at Yorktown in 1781. And then we create something called the Articles of Confederation. And this, I remember studying this at school and having no idea what it was. And what it is, is our first constitution. It's the first set of rules that this new group of, of colonies that have come together as a country, the first time rules they will follow. Now, when we adopted the Articles of Confederation, we elected this gentleman, John Hansen, as the, first pre as the president of the United States. Now, his title at the time was President of the United States in Congress Assembled. So there are a lot of people, if you look it up in history, who will say to you, ah, the first, real first president is John Hansen, because that was our first constitution. Now, we were not an independent nation yet. We had defeated Cornwallis, but this goes on a little bit, and again, at that point in the Articles of Confederation, presidents could only serve a term of one year. So there's a list of a whole bunch of other men who served as president of the Congress assembled, or of the United States. Now, that president was able to do a number of things. I mean, our, you know, for, of course, today our presidents do a lot more. But they were able to call for congressional assemblies and adjournment. They signed military commissions. They received diplomats. And they did many of the presidential duties. So now we have another turn of events. In 1783, the British finally said, all right, we give up. You can be a country. And that is called the Treaty of Paris. And that's where we officially became an independent country. 
And this is the famous Benjamin West painting of the delegates. You can see Benjamin Franklin right in the center. And you'll notice how it's unfinished. Because when they asked the British representatives to sit for the painting, what do you think they said? I don't think so. No, they were not at all thrilled about losing the colonies, and they simply never sat for the portraits, so we only have the American representatives. Now, there are people in New Jersey who will tell you, this guy's the first president. That's Elias Boudinot. And he served as president of the United States in Congress assembled on the day that the Treaty of Paris was signed. So now the question becomes, what happened next? Well, in 1787, there was the famous the Constitutional Convention in the State House, what we call now Independence Hall. And after months of debates and arguing and so forth, they came up with a new constitution. Now, that constitution didn't start until 1789. And what the people, what they did, by the way, at the time, I just think you find this interesting. The representatives at the, at the congressional constitution said, you know, you guys and me, you can't elect a president. What do you know? So they created something called the Electoral College. They, the popular vote was not counted. You could vote, but it didn't mean much because the rem people in the legislature picked the representatives for the Electoral College. And they also said there shall be no political parties. What we're going to do is have electoral votes. And the, the best man wins. He gets the most electoral votes. He becomes president. And the second best man that wins, he gets the second most electoral votes. He becomes vice president. So we'll get the best guys. Now, that lasted about a week until we got political parties. The first political parties were Thomas Jefferson, who created the uh, what's called at the time the Democratic Republican Party, and John Adams, who created a party called the Federalists. But in the interim, that's what happened. So um, George Washington got 69 electoral votes for the first time, and he was elected by the representatives as president under the new Constitution. So he was the first president under the new Constitution. But prior to that, there were seven men who served as president of the Continental Congress and eight men under the Articles of Confederation. So who is really the first president of the United States? Is it Peyton Randolph? Could it be John Hancock, who, was, who wrote president when we declared independence? Could it be John Hanson, when we had the, the Articles of Confederation, our first constitution, he was the first president? Or Elias Boudinot. There are people, I'm telling you, in New Jersey who swear that that was when the Treaty of Paris was signed, and he's really the first president. Or, of course, are we going to stick with George Washington? Well, I just thought you'd be interested in a little background, and you can kind of make your own decisions. Now, let me talk about who was our first American-born president. Um, the Constitution is up there. It says you have to be uh, no person except a natural-born citizen or citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of the Constitution shall be eligible for the office of president. So our first seven presidents were not Americans. They were all born as British citizens. And again, it was in 1783 that we became an uh, independent country. Now, the history books, and this is where I argue with the history books, they say, ah, Martin Van Buren, he was born in 1782. That makes him the first American-born president. 
I would disagree with that, because we didn't become an independent nation until nine months later. And then we get William Henry Harrison, born in 1773. Um, and to me, the first real American-born president is John Tyler of Virginia. Now, where do you hear about him, by the way? Really interesting character. Now, did you know that we had a president for a day? We had a one-day president. And you all knew this, I'm sure. And there he is, David Rice Acheson. He was a one-day president. Now, I'll show you how this happened. Um, Mr. A Acheson is on the right. The gentleman on the left is the vice president of the United States. And there was a uh, election, and in March, oh, initially the president took his inauguration on March the 4th. Now it's in January. Originally it was the 4th of March. Now on the second day of March, 1849, the sitting vice president, Mr. George M. Dallas, said, man, I'm bored, I'm going home. And he picked up his baggage and he went home. Can you imagine? He left. Okay, now Mr. Acheson on the right there, he was the president pro tem of the Senate at the time. So now we get the incoming president, and in the morning, though, James K. Polk signed the last of his recession on the morning of March 4th. And he said at 6.30 in the morning, thus closed my official term as president. So on the morning of March 4th, the vice president had packed his bags and gone home. The president said, I'm done for the day, and he left. So what happened was the new incoming president, Zachary Taylor, and he said, well, March the 4th falls on Sunday. That's the Sabbath, and I don't want to be inaugurated on a Sunday. So he said, I'll be inaugurated March 5th. So now look at this. On March 4th, the president left. The vice president had already gone home. The new inauguration wouldn't be to the following day. So who becomes president? The president became David Rice Acheson. And he served as president for a day. The Secession Act of 1791 said at that point that the president pro tem of the Senate would become president in the absence of the president and vice president. So almost immediately, as you can see, there's a newspaper thing, the president you never heard of. Now, Mr. Acheson, in all honesty, said, I never for a moment acted as president of the United States. And yet, there's a, a beautiful statue and historical marker from Missouri, where he is, that says, David Rice Acheson, president of the United States one day. And this is his grave site, and you can see what it says there. President of the United States for one day, Sunday, March 4th, 1849. Isn't that kind of neat? Now, what's really also interesting is, do you know on one day we had two presidents? Same kind of thing happened. Uh, this was the double presidency, March 4th, 1877. Now, March 4th, again, fell on a, on a Sunday. And this president said, I don't want to be inaugurated on the Sabbath on a Sunday. So on the 3rd, he took the oath of office. So Rutherford B. Hayes took the oath of office on March 3rd. Now, the president was Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant said, I'm sticking it out till the end. So he stayed until the last day bit of business on March 4th. So since the new president had been inaugurated and the sitting president wouldn't leave, on March 4th, we had two presidents, Mr. Grant and Mr. Hayes. You think things are confused now. Now, here are a bunch of interesting presidential facts. I think you'll find this kind of fun. 
Um, first of all, I don't know how many of you watch the State of the Union message every year, where the president gets up, you know, and does this big speech and whatever. Okay. Well, Thomas Jefferson, there on the left, uh, he, uh, is it your left? Yeah, here he is. Yeah, on your left. Uh, he said, what a waste of my time. And Jefferson said, I'll write the speech because the Constitution requires it. The Constitution says you must have the State of the Union. But heck if I'm going there to read it. So he handed it to the clerk of Congress and said, you read it into the record. I'm not going to bother. And every president following him until Woodrow Wilson in 1913 did the same thing. They simply handed the State of the Union to the clerk of Congress, and they read it into the record, and that was the end of it. So Mr. Wilson decided that he was going to do the, to do the reading, and it changed, of course, the way presidents do it. Because it became to Mr. Wilson, and what he said was, hey, this is a great PR opportunity. I can go into the hall with Congress. You know how the president comes in now and shakes hands and there's yelling and waving and screaming and whatever. And he figured that's a good way to make, a, you know, make an appearance. So it all changes in 1913. Our shortest president was James Madison. He was only 5'4". Our tallest was Mr. Lincoln. That's 6'4". You're going to hear more about Mr. Lincoln later. William Henry Harrison, he, did, he made a big mistake. He gave the longest ever inaugural speech, 8,445 words in 90 minutes. Can you imagine standing in front of there? There's no microphones, remember. That's what you're going to hear. And what happened was it was a cold, it was wet, it was dreary. Apparently, he picked up a virus. And 33 days later, into his presidency, he died in office. Now, one of the other things Harrison did is right after his inaugural speech, he sat for his first official portrait. And he is the first president to have his picture taken. It's something called the daguerreotype, which is the earliest form of photography. Now, tragically, the original picture is gone. It disappeared, and there's only a copy in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But he's the first president to have his picture taken with a camera. Now, here's Mr. Tyler. First of all, John Tyler was our busiest president. He had 15 children. I don't know when he had time to be president, to be honest with you. <laughs> Nevertheless, he had 15 kids. This was a guy, he, was a, he became known as his accidency instead of his presidency because he was the one when Harrison died because of the, of the cold, he became president without being elected. So they named him your accidency. Um, as you can see, some of the comments in the newspapers one newspaper called him a poor, miserable, despised imbecile. And in the Times called him the most unpopular public man has ever held office in the United States. People did not like Mr. Tyler. And then one of the things is he's the former president of the United States. And when the Civil War started, he joined the Confederate government. Isn't that amazing? Meanwhile, what's so interesting to me, he is, from that era, the only president who has a living grandson. The gentleman at the bottom right, Harrison Ruffin Tyler, born in 1928. So Tyler has a direct descendant living grandson. Now, here's another guy who made a pretty big mistake. This is General Zachary Taylor. Now, they were building the Washington Monument, and they had a big, you know, fundraiser. And the president went to the fundraiser, and guess, remember, you know when the cherry blossoms come out? So he was said, oh, look at these cherries. So he started eating all these cherries, and he washed it down with cold milk. 
Well, somewhere in that milk and cherries was a horrible bacteria, and within two weeks, he was passed on. He probably killed himself, we, you know, very tragically. His son, Richard Taylor, was a general in the Confederate Army, and his daughter, Sarah Knox Taylor, became the first wife of the future Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. A few little interesting tidbits here. One of my favorites, this is Franklin Pierce. Now, Franklin Pierce was, well, happened to be a Democrat at the time, and he was such a miserable guy that the, even the, the, his own party refused to endorse him for, for renomination. So they said, you're just going to have to leave. And he said, well, there's nothing else left to do but get drunk. He got elected. Um, it's a long story. Um, he got elected, the two political parties were fighting, and it became a matter of the political platform before the Civil War. So the North voted for him. And uh, the, it turned out he was not a very pleasant guy. Abraham Lincoln was often criticized because of his unkempt appearance. And there you see on the left, Lincoln with a bad hair day. Newspapers said it was a thatch of wild Republican hair. <laughs> now, this is really cool. Um, did you know before 1970, Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving Day, and Independence Day were not holidays? They were simply not celebrated. I mean, we celebrated Christmas, but it wasn't an, a holiday. And Ulysses Grant, in 1870, passed a resolution that those four days shall be national holidays. That's how we get a day off. And the reason he did it, because of the Civil War, having torn the country apart, he thought having some national holidays would bring people together. Oh, here's Rutherford B. Hayes. Someday, folks, I have to come back and talk to you about the election of 1876. You, that's the, the worst election ever in American history. Rutherford B. Hayes lost the popular vote by 250,000 votes. Imagine. But there was no electoral winner. And it went to Congress. And Congress kept voting and voting. And they finally brokered a deal and made him president. So as a result of that, they used to call him rather fraud or your fraudulency. They also called him Granny Hayes because he didn't drink, smoke, or gamble. Oh, this is really hilarious. This is Benjamin Harrison. Uh, he's president from 1889 to 1893. Now, in 1891, they electrified the White House. The White House got electric lights. Benjamin Harrison and his wife were so scared, they figured they'd die by pushing the buttons. They refused to turn off the lights. So the White House staff had to run around behind them, turning on and off the lights. They never touched the light switch. Whenever they would leave, they would leave the lights on. And, uh, the, and whenever they went into a room, somebody had to turn the lights on for them. They wouldn't touch a light switch. This is another good story. Grover Cleveland, he was an, a, a lawyer. He was an older gentleman and a lawyer. And he, one of his friends passed away, and he made him the guardian of his 11-year-old daughter. So when that daughter grew up to be 21, Grover Cleveland married her. They were over 20 years apart, which was not unusual. But that is, her name is Frances Folsom. She became the youngest first lady ever at the age of 21. She was, by the way, during that era, she was the Jackie Kennedy of uh, the country. She was a young, vibrant, vivacious woman. People really loved her. For the baseball fans, the Phillies pitchers and catchers are in there. The batters are in there. William Howard Taft, 1910, first guy to throw out the first pitch for a baseball game. 
Warren Harding in 1940-21, first president ever to ride to his inauguration in that new invention called the motor car. Before that, they either walked or they rode in a horse and buggy. He was the first one to drive in a car. What an adventure. I have a, a, a postcard from a gentleman who was at uh, toured the Gettysburg battlefield. And he said, I had a wonderful time. I toured the battlefield in a machine. Uh, give me one second here. OK. OK. Herbert Hoover, this, I found this fascinating. This is President Herbert Hoover and his wife. Both of them were fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Isn't that amazing? They both spoke Chinese. And what they would do, they would go to the events. You know, they'd have formal dinners. And if they wanted to say something to each other, they didn't want other people to hear, they spoke in Chinese. They both had spent a lot of time in China as a young man. He was an envoy in China, and he and his wife learned fluent Mandarin Chinese. And they used it in the White House. So they would go to a formal dinner, and he would say in Chinese, look at that one, Oy, uh, you know? <laughs> but they did it in Chinese. And it aggravated people. I mean, people were aggravated. What did he say? You know? <laughs> Here's Harry S. Truman. Bet you didn't know he served in World War I as an artillery commander. There he is as a captain. His artillery uh, battery fired more than 10,000 rounds during World War I. And you know, his name is Harry S. Truman. You know what the S stands for? Absolutely nothing. It's simply Harry S. Truman. His middle name is S. Doesn't stand for anything. Richard Nixon, his paternal great, his fraternal uh, great grandfather, fought for the Union, died at the Battle of Gettysburg, and is buried there at the Gettysburg National Cemetery. George Nixon. This is very tragic. There you see future President Kennedy and his brother Joseph P. Kennedy. Um, President Kennedy's brother, Joseph, with older brother, both were in the Navy in World War II. And Joseph volunteered for a very secret, very secret Navy operation. And what it was called Operation Anvil. We were losing hundreds in planes and, of course, many hundreds of pilots and navigators and bombardiers being shot down over Germany. So the Navy and also the Air Force, the Army Air Force, came up with an idea of using what they call drones. Now today, everybody knows what a drone is. I mean, a lot of your, your grandkids might have them, and they fly them around. Well, this was new technology. Nobody understood it. And there you can see a lower airplane. So they took an old bomber, and they would strip it with everything and fill it with explosives, and then the uh, the plane above it would send electrical signals to that bomber. They were going to fly it over Germany and drop the bomber with all its bombs onto Germany on the industrial sites. Now, the trouble is that the drone thing was in its infancy, and it simply wasn't technologically ready yet. But what happened was those drone planes filled with explosives, how do you get them off the air, off the ground, rather? Well, you had to get pilots to volunteer to fly these explosive planes up. They were then going to, here's the plan. They're going to fly over the English Channel. The pirates, the pi pirates, I'm sorry, the pilots will arm the explosives. They will then jump out of the plane, parachute into the English Channel, and the Navy will pick them up. And then the guide plane will send it on to Germany. Well, tragically, while this was an interesting idea, it simply didn't work. When Lieutenant Kennedy, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., armed the explosives, it exploded. And his memorial is at Arlington National Cemetery. 
President Johnson's great paternal grandfather, Nixon's fought for the Union, Johnson's fought for the Confederacy, because he's from Texas. Bless you. Gerald Ford, did you know, this is really cool, Gerald Ford's original, his birth name is Leslie Lynch King Jr. He's really Leslie King. Now what happened was his father was an abusive man. Uh, he beat the mother, he was very abusive, and the mother finally uh, got rid of him and she was able to divorce him and she married another gentleman named Gerald Rudolph Ford. So the young boy said, I don't want to be named after my father. He was Leslie uh, Lynch King Jr. So he changed his name to his adopted father and became Gerald R. Ford Jr. He is the only president never have to have been elected at all. Remember, we had Spiru Agnew. Remember Sp old Spiru? You know what happened to him? He got convicted of fraud. So Nixon picked Gerald Ford to be press, vice president. And then, of course, Nixon had his famous tapes. So when he left, Gerald Ford became president. So he's the only president who was never elected by anybody. He's also the only president to do two assassination attempts 17 days apart. And I didn't remember this personally, but it's amazing that in September 5th of 1975, the young lady on the left, uh, Lynette Fromm, tried to shoot uh, Ford. And then 17 days later, in almost the same place, a Sarah Jane Moore made the same attempt. This is George H.W. Bush. How many of you knew that he was a fighter? He was a pilot, a bombardier during World War II. He, won the, he was received the Distinguished Flying Cross and flew 58 missions. And the picture of the submarine, that is an actual photograph. He was shot down in 1944, and that is George Bush in the uh, raft being picked up by the submarine, saving his life. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know who is, I don't know. I never looked his wife up. Sorry. Now, let's look at this. Isn't this nice? That's the president's cabinet. It is. It really is. It came out of the White House. That is actually the president's cabinet. Now, to me, I was always curious as to how we got a cabinet. I mean, it's, that's the cabinet. So I, try, I looked it up, and just to give you a little background, that's the cabinet today. And it starts way, way back. It starts back in the 17th century. And it wasn't a good thing. Cabinets really, they called them cabinet councils. And they were introduced by the English. And... Um, Sir Francis Bacon writes, for which inconveniences the doctrine of Italy and the practice of France in some king's times hath introduced cabinet councils, a remedy worse than the disease. In other words, don't ask so many opinions. It isn't going to help. And then uh, Charles I, apparently, back in uh, the 17th century, introduced his Privy Council. Now, this was a secret group of advisors. So the original cabinet, the reason they called it a cabinet, because you could close the doors. So that's how it gets the term cabinet council. The presidential cabinet does not appear in the Constitution. There is nothing in American law that says the president needs to have a cabinet. If any president decided, he could say, to heck with it, and get rid of them. He doesn't have to have a cabinet. There's nothing requiring. It's pure tradition. Probably started by James Madison. We believe that our fifth president, our shortest president, is the one who came up with the idea of a presidential council or cabinet. 
And today there is a Presidential Succession Act, and it starts with the Vice President, then the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, and then the Cabinet members in the order in which the Cabinet um, uh, position was created. Isn't that cool? Little things. I bet you, you knew this one. This is the first lady to run for President of the United States. Yes, ladies, one of you did. But what did I tell you about her? She's not your average lady. Um, this is Victoria uh, Schalfen. Uh, she got married to a guy named Canning Woodall. Did you see a picture there, kind of a drawing of it? Now, the worst thing about Canning was he also, in that era, very common, he was a very abusive man. And she eventually got rid of him. She divorced him, but she kept his name. Now, she and her sister figured, how do we make a living? You know, women couldn't work in those days. It was hard to make a living. So she decided, ah, I have the ability to be a clairvoyant. I can look in your eyes and tell you what's going to happen in the future. Did you ever meet one of those? Well, she bumped into the richest man in the world, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And she said, Mr. Vanderbilt, I can help you with the future. I can read the tea leaves. He was so impressed, he made her very wealthy. And he gave her so much money, she became the first stockbroker on Wall, female stockbroker on Wall Street. That's the first lady stockbroker. Then she was the first woman to appear before Congress. Do you know until 1871, not one woman was allowed to testify in front of Congress? Yeah, go try. You're not entitled to anything. Well, she was the first one in 1871. And you know what she testified about? How about taxation without representation? We're being, I'm a woman. I'm being taxed and I'm not represented. An interesting lady. Uh, then she and her sister started a newspaper. As you can see here, the purpose of the newspaper was to support her candidacy for president of the United States. She formed her own political party, which was called the Cosmo Political Party. Why, I don't know. It was also called the Equal Rights Party. And she tried to get her name on the ballot to run for President of the United States. Now, she picked Frederick Douglass as her vice presidential running mate. And you know what Frederick Douglass said? I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> so they used his picture, but he was never part of the campaign. Well, when she ran for president, her name was on the ballot in a couple of states, but her votes were not counted. We have no idea if she got any or how many votes she received. Well, what's interesting in the law is that women could not vote, but women could run for office if they chose to. So there's nothing illegal about her running for office, except one thing. You know, there's always a but. She would believed in free love. She had a husband and a boyfriend living with her. Ooh. <laughs> And the day of the election, the election day, 1872, Victoria Woodall was in prison for sending pornographic materials through the mail. <laughs> uh, she was eventually acquitted. She then ran again for president, tried to, in 1884 and 1892, but her name never appeared on any ballots. She then left the country and passed in Europe in 1927. But notorious Victoria is the first lady to actually try to run for president. Now, I should tell you, by the way, in those days, going back, uh, you know, many years, there were numerous political parties. You could easily form your own political party. You know, today you have Republicans and Democrats and, and some little fringe groups, you know. But in those days, if you didn't like what was going on, you, you could form your own party and it, it became a national party. If you look at, um, oh, what was the year? 19, I guess it was 1914, uh, Teddy Roosevelt left the Republican Party. When he ran for president, he was on the Progressive Party. 
So you had Republicans, Democrats, and progressives. So that was proper in those days. So let's look a little at George. You all know the story? George Washington went out to his father's orchard with his little axe and cut down the tree and said, Daddy, I cannot tell a lie. I used my little axe to cut down the tree. Complete nonsense. First of all, George Washington was raised in a very wealthy household. It is very doubtful that his father would either give him an axe or that he would know how to use it. Nevertheless, this story was invented by the gentleman you see up on the screen. His name is Mason Locke Weems. And he wrote a history of George Washington. Now, he was nice enough to do this after President Washington had passed away, because then Washington couldn't say, hey, this is all a lot of nonsense. He wanted to extol Washington's virtues as a great man. So he made up the cherry tree, and I cannot tell a lie story. It's completely fictitious. He also made up the story of Washington praying for guidance at Valley Forge. Now, I have no doubt that Washington prayed, but certainly not in the manner portrayed by Weems. And then my favorite Weems story, Washington threw a dollar over the Potomac. Remember that one? Except the Potomac's a mile wide. And I doubt that Mr. Washington was able to do that. So people today know that everyone recognizes Weems' histories for the fiction that they are. Now, what kind of teeth did George Washington have? Wooden teeth. Wrong. George Washington had never had wooden teeth. Nobody had wooden teeth. Where that comes from, to be honest with you folks, I've done a lot of research. I don't know where in history this idea of wooden teeth came from. A historic Mount Vernon, which has a huge library and all his journals, they don't know where it came from. Somehow, it came out that Washington had wooden teeth. Now, Washington suffered with dental troubles his whole life. And um, by the way, somebody asked me this question, and I, and I have to just tell you the story. You see all the paintings of Washington. You notice he never smiles. Now, that is cultural for that era. It has nothing to do with your teeth. Today, when, they, when you take out your phone or a camera, what's the first thing they say to you? Smile. Say cheese. Well, in that era, it was culturally inappropriate to smile. You had to show your culture and your manners. So you always had your picture taken. That was the culture of the period. So you, you'll never see a painting with somebody going, hey, you know, it just doesn't happen. So, but it, he did have trouble. This is from historic Mount Vernon. Washington's teeth were made out of ivory, they were made out of bone, uh, lead, gold, and they also used real human teeth. Teeth that had fallen out of other people's mouths and they then would put them into his dentures. Yeah, one lady back there is going, ooh. <laughs> but that's exactly what they did. Matter of fact, in the journals of Mount Vernon, it actually says, now we don't know that these teeth went to Washington, but a Dr. Lemoyne paid two shillings to Negroes for nine teeth. Now they didn't pull them out of their mouth. These are teeth that fell out and they purchased them for someone's use. Now, Washington's teeth helped win the American Revolution. Washington was encamped up in White Plains, New York, and he sent a courier down to Virginia to tell his family, among other things, send my dental tools, I'm having trouble with my teeth. Now that courier was captured by the British, and British General Sir Henry Clinton read the correspondence, and he said, you know what? Washington's staying in New York, he's not moving south. Well, of course, what Clinton didn't know is that Washington and the French forces were indeed moving south. 
And they marched from New York um, through uh, Lambertville and Hopewell and through Philadelphia down Frank, what's today Frankfurt Avenue and marched to Virginia and defeated Cornwallis. So some people believe Washington's teeth helped win the war. Why not? Now, you'll notice that Washington always wears a wig, right? Wrong. Washington never wore a wig. Washington hated wigs. And Washington was a natural redhead. Yeah, he was a redhead. But instead of his red hair, he powdered his hair. That is hair powder. He never wore a wig. And there's young George, our red-headed buddy. Now, one last thing about George, whoops. In those days, uh, people drank fermented spirits. A lot of people would say, hey, this is great. Uh, they drank whiskey, they drank beer, they drank ginger beer, uh, they drank anything you could ferment. They didn't know why, but they knew that water could make you sick. So they fermented things and then they drank that. Now Washington's thinking, hey, this is cool, I can make a buck on this. Do you know he's the only president that ever ran a distillery? He had a huge distillery at Mount Vernon that distilled more than 11,000 gallons of whiskey every year. Today, they recreated it at historic Mount Vernon, and you can go in there and sip from Washington's original recipe. And now I have to tell you one of my favorite Washington stories, and that's the story of Washington's recipe for eggnog. Now, I did share this with you when, we, when I did Christmas with you, but for those of you who weren't here, there, this is Washington's actual recipe for eggnog. Now, we'll skip the bottom part. The top part's the fun part. One quart of cream, one quart of milk, a dozen tablespoons of sugar, and then one pint of brandy, half a pint of rye whiskey, half a pint of Jamaican rum, and a quarter pint of sherry. Mix it all together, let it ferment, and this is absolutely true. The last thing of his recipe, it says, taste frequently. So George, brandy, whiskey, Jamaican rum, and sherry. Now, he may not be smiling in the paintings, but he's smiling at home, believe me. Isn't that kind of cool? All right, let's look at presidential duels quickly. Two of our presidents that we know of got into duels. One was more honorable than the other. Um, first of all, in the 1700s, there were all these men were having duels. What's amazing is if you said something to somebody, well, you know the story Hamilton and Burr had their duel. Well, that was in the, uh, a little later in the early 1800s, but people had duels. They were all busy shooting at each other. So what happened is if you insulted somebody and they insulted you back, you would say, I challenge you to a duel. Well, they actually came up with a set of rules called the code duello, meaning these are the rules you have to follow. You can't just go around shooting people. And here are the, some dueling pistols on the right. That's the, the Burr Hamilton pistols. They're in the collection of uh, Morgan Chase Bank. And here's in Princeton, they show you some dueling pistols there. So f future President Andrew Jackson got into a duel with this gentleman named Charles Dickinson. Now Dickinson had insulted Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, and Jackson took umbrage. And he said, I challenge you to a duel. Now Dixon was one of the best shots in America. However, on that day, when they said present and you, they pulled their pistols, Dickinson fired and he missed. Now, at the same time, Andrew Jackson fires his pistol, and it misfires. It doesn't work. Now, Dickinson figures, OK, that's that. And he puts his pistol down, and he stands there. And Jackson plays with the, with the, with the mechanism, takes the gun, and kills him dead. He was not prosecuted, because they said, even though he didn't follow the rules, but he shot the guy dead. 
Um, here's Abraham Lincoln. Did you know Lincoln was in a duel? I bet not. Lincoln didn't like to talk about it. It's one of the hidden secrets of Lincoln's life. Now, Lincoln got into a fight with this guy, and his name is James Shields. Now, James Shields was a politician. They were both from Illinois, and neither of them liked each other. Lincoln couldn't stand Shields, and Shields didn't like Lincoln. So Lincoln started writing articles saying that Shields was a miserable-looking guy and no woman would want him. And this all appeared in the paper. So Shields is livid. And Shields goes to Lincoln. He says, I challenge you to a duel. And Lincoln says, okay, fine, we'll have a duel. Now, if you're challenged, you get to pick the, the dueling implements, the instruments. And Lincoln's thinking, oh, I'm going to outfox this guy. I'm not picking pistols. I'm picking broadswords. Cavalry sabers from that era of 1840. The sabers were huge. They were this long. They were giant sabers. So they go to the field that morning, and of course, now we see the difference. Uh, Shields was a typical man of that era. He was about 5'7", about this big, and had regular arms. Lincoln is 6'4", and has long arms. So Lincoln takes his sword, and he looks at a tree, and he takes the sword with his long arms, and he goes, and knocks the branch right off the tree. So Mr. Shields looked at this and says, oh, that's fine, we're even. And he walked away. Lincoln completely outfoxed him. Later on, Mr. Shields became a general in the Union Army and was considered to be one of the worst generals in the Union Army. By early 1862, the Army said to please go away, and he resigned. That did not stop him, by the way. He served in the Senate for three terms. Mr. Lincoln, when they asked him about the duel, he, didn't, he wasn't proud of this, but he said, I do not deny it. But if you desire my friendship, you will never mention it again. And then real quickly, let me see. I got five minutes. Okay. Let me just talk about two presidents. Very interesting. They fought in the American Revolutionary War. The first one is little Andrew Jackson. He comes from South Carolina. And what happened was the war ruined his family. Uh, this was a terrible war in the backwoods of South Carolina. Uh, the British and the Indians, their allies, terrorized the colonials who were supporting the rebellion or the revolution. There was one massacre called Buford's Massacre, and this is where Banastray Tarleton and his men cut down the surrendering Americans and killed them on the battlefield. Now, what happened was uh, little Andrew Jackson, his two brothers died in the revolution, one in, on a prison ship and one in a battle, and his mother also died of smallpox. But by the end, oh, there was another point where he had been captured as a little boy, and the English officer came to Andrew Jackson and said, you, sign my, shine my boots. And you know what little Andrew Jackson said? No. The officer took his sword and slashed him. He carried that scar for the rest of his life. But by the age of 15, Andrew Jackson was a hardened veteran of the American Revolution. And then I'll talk quickly about James Monroe. Uh, he also enlisted in the military. He was only 16 when he started. Uh, he served in, remember Washington attacked Trenton and defeated the Hessians on Christmas Day of 1776. Well, James Monroe, the future president, was there. And this is a very famous Trumbull painting of that uh, battle. And um, I know you can't see it. I'm just going to jump up here real quick. But there's a guy who's wounded. I know it's very hard to see down here, but that is James Monroe. Now, he also appears, let me just jump here real quick because my time's running out. He also appears in this beautiful painting by Emanuel Leutze. 
the famous one of Washington crossing the Delaware. And that gentleman standing behind Washington is expected to be James Monroe, the future president of the United States. So um, this is uh, James Monroe, by the way, was also at Valley Forge. Now, you know that winter of Valley Forge when it was real cold and bitter? Do you know how many important men stayed with the army? Benedict Arnold was there. Andrew ha Alexander Hamilton was there. Aaron Burr was in the army. He was there. Lafayette was there. Anthony Wayne, Henry Knox, and even Martha Washington stayed with her husband during that terrible winter. And the last one I think I have time for, now you all liked Lincoln, didn't you? <laughs> Maybe not so much now. Well, what happened was in those days, the government, there were no income taxes. And the government was supported by something called tariffs. Now you may hear about that in the papers once in a while. A tariff is a synonym for tax. It's exactly the same thing. What the government does is puts taxes on imported goods to make them more expensive so you buy American goods. But when those imported goods come here, who pays that higher price? We do. Not the country it comes from, the consumer pays. So a tariff is a tax. They're exactly the same thing. They just hide the name. Well, what happened was in 1861, the Civil War started. So Lincoln and Salmon Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, figured out, you know, we're not getting a lot of imports. How do we raise money? And they had a brilliant idea. It's called the National Tax Law. And they created something called the Internal Revenue Service. So April 15th, guys, you can blame Abe. It's his idea. Now, in the Confederacy, of course, they didn't pay income taxes. They were in rebellion, but they had Confederate money, which, of course, was kind of useless. In 1895, the Supreme Court said that this income tax is unconstitutional, and they threw it out. A great day, but not for us. It was a great day for the richest people in the country, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Morgans, because they could accumulate their wealth and never have to pay one penny in taxes. They became, this was called the Gilded Age, if you remember that uh, idea. And of course, they built their little summer cottages in Newport. Well, the government got upset. And under President Taft, they came out with this wonderful idea that Abe Lincoln had. And they passed a, a, a constitutional amendment, and there it is, the 16th Amendment, giving us the national income tax. Now, another idea that Abe had. You thought Abe was such a good guy. Well, what happened is, remember taxation without representation? Well, the English government back in the 1700s, they put out something called a stamp tax. And they, anything you bought, you had to pay for this stamp. What do you think Lincoln did? Same thing. During the Civil War in 1863, he came out with a stamp act. And if you bought playing cards, medicines, any luxuries, legal documents, you had to pay one cent, two cent, three cents, whatever, for a government stamp. And then something became really popular, and that was the photograph. They invented something of, of carte de visite, a visiting card, so you could go and get your picture taken, and I could give you my picture and you could give me yours. And Lincoln said, what a wonderful idea. I'll tax it. And there it is. When you bought a picture from 1864 on, you had to pay the government tax on that picture. And then the last thing I'll have time for is to put to rest all this nonsense about Lincoln's illnesses. And you've all heard these stories. Oh, Abe Lincoln, oh my God, he had every disease known to man. He did not. Lincoln, as a young man, he cut down trees, he worked on riverboats, he split logs. Um, he did so many things. 
And one of the big stories is that he had something called Marfan syndrome, which he did not. It's a genetic disease, and he did not have it. He was simply tall with long arms. That's all it was. He was very strong. Uh, Harold Holzer, who's the preeminent Lincoln historian in America. You probably see him on TV a lot. And he said, Lincoln ran, wrestled, lifted heavy objects with the best of them. He was usually served as the end man in a tug of war. And there's a classic comic, if you remember those, showing Lincoln as a wrestler. Now, what's really interesting is Lincoln loved to read. He was like a, a bookworm. And he was home one day in Salem, Illinois, and a young bully, you know, one of these tough kids, well, he came up to Lincoln and he challenged him and he knocked the book out of his hand. Lincoln picked the guy up and threw him to the ground. Well, Lincoln became one of the best wrestlers of that period. And they said Lincoln had maybe only one recorded defeat in a dozen years. And you want to hear a great one? In 1992, President Lincoln was in inducted in the Wrestling Hall of Fame. There he is. I love the little shirt they put on him. But he is in the rational, National Wrestling Hall of Fame. And the last thing I can say about Lincoln, because my time is up, is this is the riverboat, as you can see, that he would, would work on. And a lot of times, these riverboats would run aground. They would, you know, on the, on the banks. So he is the only president who has a patent. He patented this model that you see here, which has inflatable uh, tubes on the side. And he said, if you pump up these tubes, then the, the riverboat will, will rise up and will, uh, you know, can float again. So there he is. That's the only patent that a president has. So my time is up. Next time, maybe we'll do a little more presidential stuff, because I could tell you about the president's secret surgery and a number of other interesting tidbits. I hope you found this fun. I hope you found it a little educational and interesting. Um, again, I want to thank all of you for coming down to see me. I just love it when I have so many people here. So thank you so much for coming down.